Welcome everyone to our electrifying weekly mishaps video roundup. Buckle up and prepare for a roller coaster ride through the wild and wonderful world of fails, glitches, and oh so relatable moments that will have you laughing, cringing, and nodding in agreement. Remember to hit that like button and subscribe to our channel to join the growing number of tech enthusiasts who revel in these hilarious tales. And don't forget to share this video with your friends. We promise they'll thank you for the much needed laughter therapy. It's time to embrace the chaos and have a good laugh together. Happy watching. English teachers and professors, what non-plagiarized paper was the worst paper you ever graded? Story 1. Actually a former English teacher, current English professor. I can't think of a single worst, but here are some crazy ones in my Hall of Fame. 1. When I taught 8th grade, I had to insist that a photo of a koala bear off Google Images would not serve as a proper paper title. 2. Just a sad one. One student half did a paper with a fully MLA formatted first page, two sentences, and an I'm sorry, Mrs. Lancer Landshark. 3. The paper wasn't bad, but despite going over APA title pages at length in class, I had a student who turned in their APA paper with a teal and turquoise book-like MS Word cover template that was gaudy and had very little of the required info. 4. I can think of many where the writing was just poor or didn't have proper grammar, but one goof was from a recent semester that sticks out in terms of errors in writing. The student did a good poetic analysis of the poem Because I Could Not Stop for Death, cited it correctly as by Emily Dickinson, yet all throughout the paper referred to the poet as Elizabeth Dickerson. Also, in one that doesn't at all count among my worst, but maybe one of my most memorable, I assigned a paper with the goal of arguing successfully for both sides, then mediating it as an advancement of lessons in argumentation. Most students chose from a list of very serious and difficult to solve problems, but one student requested to do a paper on the Our Hot Dogs Sandwiches debate. It was an impeccable paper that did reach a nice mediation, but it was also incredibly memorable among papers on illicit substance epidemics and immigration questions. Hot Dog Kid is going places. Hey, I agree. Why, does all, why do all the subjects have to be all that serious? I mean... I would do something based on video games. Is the cake really a lie? Story 2. I'm not a professor, but I was in a master's program for the last two years, and I had to peer review a classmate's paper. Holy hell. We were supposed to write a persuasive research essay on an effective way to make college more affordable. I was lucky enough to peer review a classmate and coworker who already possessed not one, but two master's degrees, and he was somehow on his way to a doctorate. I'm honestly still perplexed trying to figure out how he got those other two degrees. Anyways, the paper was littered with grammatical errors. My favorite of those was when he started making up words and talked about the problem of student indebtedness. He probably meant indebtedness, but he used it incorrectly multiple times, so make what you will of that. He also referred to the student debt problem as an extra layer on students' frustration. Yum. This person was a veteran, and at one point in the paper, he talks about the terrorist attacks of 9-11-11. I understand that that's a single number typo, but also, if you're going to state that as your reason for joining the military, at least proofread it like you care about what happened that day. The good part, however, was his actual argument. For some reason, he was arguing that college should be more affordable, but only for veterans. You mean the GI Bill? He said that we can make this happen by simply cutting the salaries of professors and giving that money back to the students. We're going to save colleges and universities in America by failing to pay our professors, everyone. Nope, nope. I'll just know all around. If this guy was a veteran and he was on his way to a doctorate and still had trouble getting a paper done at all, that argument about just for veterans 
just doesn't hold any water. I'm not saying veterans don't deserve education, but no. What do you think? Story 3. Not a professor, but I had to peer review a bit for my scientific writing course in my first year of college. It was a level 200 class, so there were a few sophomores and juniors. The way it worked was, at the beginning of the semester, our professor had assigned us to groups of six. During the peer review sessions, she would staple the papers together according to group number and give it to different groups so we wouldn't grade our own group's papers. Around midterms, we had to write a mock proposal for a scientific field of our choice, which had to be at least six pages long with headings, abstracts, materials, hypotheses, etc. The one who wrote the best proposal got a Dunkin' Donuts gift card. I found one of the junior's proposals and, oh, my deity. She only wrote two pages, had no discernible format, used a typewriter font, had no headings, and it was just her blabbering on about how herbal medicine helped her mental illness. There wasn't any real conclusion because, from what I could tell, she didn't even have a hypothesis. There was so much wrong with the paper that I just moved on without writing anything. The real kicker is that she always promoted her self-published book on our class discussion board. P.S. I won the gift card. Methinks there's a reason it was self-published. I don't know, do you think it was sabotage? Because this person was talking about how herbal medicine helped out and she was trying to be all natural. What reason would she have for a Dunkin' Donuts gift card? None, I would think. None. Mm -mm. Story 4. This truly is my time. I was a teacher in a high school. I taught some lower-achieving kids in an English class. They were around 14 to 16 years old. One kid, Paul, was particularly bad, not through a lack of intelligence, but effort. Paul is also a native English speaker. This is important to remember. Paul did not submit his persuasive essay when it was due and continued to fail to submit it for another month and a half. I kept reminding him, phoning home, emailing other staff, etc. Paul, who was the only pupil who did not submit his essay, believed I was picking on him and singling him out. Finally, in what I can only imagine in a fit of sudden inspiration linked to this belief, I received the following unceremoniously submitted 400-word masterpiece. Is teacher bias? Perhaps. Yes, perhaps. It was also all typed in a funky, bold, jagged font. Here is a brief summary slash extract. Is teacher bias? Perhaps. In my experience, teacher is very biased towards me for no reason. It went on for what he understood to be the faults in the teaching profession for most of it. However, another particular highlight was when he stated, teachers can be racist, as reports have found. He proceeded to never reference this or go into detail about racism slash reports ever again. Paul was also white. Just putting that out there. I still freaking have that essay. Story 5. As a high school French teacher, I have students do short essays on historic French topics. They need to present them in class using as much French as can be expected. Not much for first year. Much more for fourth year. I never know what the papers are about until the presentations. One year, I got three essays on Napoleon, one on Michel de Montaigne, the father of the essay, and one on dolphins. Freaking dolphins. Apparently, the last kid at Google translated the French word dauphin, saw that it can mean dolphin, and went with that. The word is historically used in French to describe the heir apparent to the throne, because the flag used by the next person in line for the throne had a big, ugly fish on it. But this kid just wrote about dolphin habitats and food preferences. The worst paper I ever personally wrote was for a college French elective course about pop culture. It wasn't too serious a class, and the professor wanted us to have fun. I wrote about the connection between the trash American faux rock documentary film Eddie and the Cruisers and the French poet Arthur Rimbaud. Since Rimbaud is referenced in the film, it wasn't too much of a stretch. I talked about both the poet and the protagonist going into exile, real and perceived homosexuality, and how both men were spurned by lovers before penning masterpieces called Season in Heck. But yeah, it was so awful. I wish I still had a copy. Story 6. Not a teacher, 
but I peer-reviewed the essay-slash-short story of a classmate of mine in my junior year of high school. We were supposed to write about a historical event from the perspective of someone who was there. For example, I wrote from the perspective of a court stenographer in one of the McCarthy trials. This girl decided to write about the first Olympic Games, but seemed to have a basic lack of understanding of history. Her story, which again was about the first Olympic Games from the perspective of an athlete, involved texting, cars, and was absolutely laden with pop culture references. In addition to this, every I was lowercase and the whole essay was center justified. Because of course it was. I'm not sure if I'm remembering this correctly, but I swear it was in Comic Sans or something like that. I didn't want to tell her that her entire story was terrible because I'm weak, so I just told her to check her capitals and punctuation and things like that. Man, peer-reviewing someone's awful work is the worst. I don't know if it's necessary, but I always feel the need to tiptoe on the direct issues like, oh, I don't think they actually had all that stuff back in 1896. I just want to tell them, I'm not trying to make enemies, but your paper makes me want to commit Sudoku. Commit Sudoku? I think a word substitution happened there so we don't offend the almighty algorithm. But texting? In 1896? I'm thinking some kind of Flintstones contraption where like a bird is just flying over and pecking out the words on someone else's like little actual stone tablet. Customer service people. What's the dumbest thing a customer has gone out of their way to complain about? Story 1. Not sure if this is really a complaint, but more sheer stupidity. At my first IT job, someone was returning a computer monitor and insisted on speaking with someone from the IT department rather than just leaving it in the cage as they were asked. So I came down to talk with them to see what was going on, and she was very adamant that I double-check the monitor to make sure all of her information was off of it. This lady literally thought all of her icons, files, and folders were saved directly to the monitor itself and wouldn't leave unless I powered it on to show her. I didn't even bother trying to explain it to her. She seemed extremely rude and it wouldn't even be worth my time. So I literally plugged it into the wall, didn't connect it to anything, and powered it on. See? It's completely blank. You're good to go. She smiled, said thank you, and left. Now, I might want to play devil's advocate here. There are all-in-one computers where the whole computer is housed within the monitor itself. I could see if she might have worked with something like that before. The monitor that I have right now as a second monitor also functions as a USB hub, so it's not just a monitor. I don't know if it's completely sheer stupidity on the customer's fault, on the customer's end. What do you think? Story 2. Worked in an electronics store to put myself through college. I worked in the computer department, but was sitting at the loss prevention desk up front to cover while the LP supervisor took a quick lunch break. An old lady comes in, asks where the dairy section is, and helps find the milk. I told her kindly that we weren't in a grocery store. She looks confused and leaves. A couple minutes later, her presumably son walks in and starts chewing my butt because I wouldn't help her find the milk. When he was done whining, I slowly waved my arm across the store and asked him which one of these aisles looks like they might have groceries in them. He stares for a good few seconds and then starts whining at me saying that I'm a butthole and he wants to see a manager. So I paged the loss prevention supervisor up to the front. The LP supervisor invited the guy to never come back to the store. I like the last ending, invited him to never come back, a story series that I really liked when someone was kicked out. They weren't kicked out. They were extended an invitation to the world, and I always liked that. Story three. Many years back, I worked for a store chain which sells all products related and connected to nature. Among them, the Himalayan salt stone lamp. Salt stone lamp. Say that five times fast. It's a stone made of salt 
that encases an electrical bulb. It's supposed to help with regulating ions in your home or office. A customer calls us to complain that their stone disappeared at home and asked for a refund. As open-minded as I can be, I, however, tried to understand what she meant exactly by disappeared. Story is, a customer removed the stone from the bulb and put it in her dishwasher to clean it. I had to be super nice with her to make her realize that salt dissolves in water, especially in hot water without her getting upset and getting offended. It was a lonely moment. Oh, well, at least this customer can be assured in realizing that it was an actual salt lamp and not some sort of plastic copy that was made to look like salt. That's authentic, and it was from nature. There's that. Story 4. Worked at a coffee shop that wasn't Starbucks. Frappuccino is a trademarked word for Starbucks blended coffee drinks. When customers would ask for frappuccinos, we would just put in the order as we called it and let them know the name for it at our store so they would recognize it when the barista called it out. Had a woman get so upset she was screaming all over the word frappuccino. According to her, it was the traditional Italian word for a blended coffee drink. It's not and we obviously thought she was stupid to tell her otherwise and how dare we insult her like that. Tried to calm her down and just say we called them something else, but it would be a similar drink. Didn't even correct her about the rest. She continued to flip out and literally looked up and called our corporate customer service line in front of us, holding up the rest of the line to have them tell her the same thing. She then started screeching to demand to talk to the president of our company and started knocking stuff off our countertop. That's when we called security to escort her the hell out of our store. Story 5. Working in sales, I had to deal with stupid people on a very regular basis. The worst was a very well-off Middle Easterner who owned several fast food restaurants in our area, seven of them all from the same chain. He came in twice a week for 13 months and complained that we were lying about the prices we had and that we were jerkwads for ripping people off on their new cars. Month 13, he came in saying he could get a new 2017 Corolla, I knew the sales guys at the local Toyota dealership well and we all got along, for less than our 2018 Civic Touring. Yeah, no fooling. It was a base model. They were cheaper. I walked into my manager's office, closed the door, and asked if I could have the use of my one get the hell out and don't come back for the quarter. He looked at me and said, your call. I walked out and told the guy that he could either buy a car from me or get the hell out and not come back because I was done being jerked around and having my time wasted when I could be dealing with real qualified customers. He bought a car for me that afternoon. Three years later, he still has it. Story 6. The best is always people who aren't using your services or paying you for anything but demanding your time and attention. Work at a vet's office part-time, and every shift, someone calls in asking about some random medication or another vet clinic when we're insanely busy, we see roughly 40 to 50 pets a day, and demand that I look up phone numbers and pricing for other clinics. People act like smartphones and the internet aren't at their disposal. The best was one time this lady called because she found a wild rabbit and wanted us to give it an exam. Explained to her to put the rabbit back outside as it could have a number of diseases and it's not safe to keep a wild animal in your house. Also, we don't see anything other than cats and dogs. She then demanded I look up a vet's office that did take wild animals and told her, Ma'am, we are very busy and this is a personal issue and you aren't a client. I will not do research for you. Have a great day. She then left us a one-star Yelp review and tried to write a complaint to the Better Business Bureau. I've had issues where I've had a business not have what I wanted, and I politely asked, do you know of another store that has this? And a lot of times they don't, but a few times they have. If you just asked politely, I'm sure someone would have helped. And the internet does exist, 
But then that's probably the kind of person that thinks all their programs and files are saved on the monitor of their computer. Story 7. Obligatory, I don't work in customer service, but my dad is an absolute nightmare about complaining for stupid reasons, usually in restaurants. The other day, he sent me this message that his mate has sent to IKEA customer service complaining about how there are too many digits in the customer number. They seem so proud of themselves for it, but all I can think about is how it's a waste of everyone's time and such a stupid thing to get worked up about. Hello, I recently purchased a lot of kitchen stuff and decided it would be a good idea to join the IKEA family beforehand. The membership number issued is 19 numbers long. I would like to point out that the estimated world population is around 7.8 billion people. Written in longhand, 7.8 billion is 10 numbers in length. So my question is, why do you need to create a membership number which is approximately 802,576,576 times more than the whole world population? Story 8. A few years ago, I was a cashier at a retail store. A pregnant woman came up and said that she was trying to leave but couldn't get in her car because a truck was parked very close to her. I paged the driver of the truck up to the cash desk. The truck driver, a middle-aged woman, came up and she and the pregnant woman got into an argument because the truck lady didn't want to leave her shopping to go move her truck. I didn't get involved and continued to cash out customers and eventually the truck lady moved her car so the pregnant lady could go home. Later, as I was cashing out the truck lady, she asked to speak to my manager. Afterwards, my manager told me that she was complaining about me because at some point she said it looked like I nodded, so I was clearly siding with the pregnant lady. My manager said, I told her I'd talk to you about it, so here I am talking to you about it, and just left it at that. What's your I finally met my online friend horror story? Story 1. I was on Meet Me. Met this guy who was super cool. We ended up texting every single day and I took the train out to Los Angeles to meet him. When I got there, he was being kind of awful and he told me that he hadn't gotten much sleep because he was partying until 5 a.m. We walked to his house and when I walked into his room, I was kind of shocked. It was an 8 by 6.5 room. All he had was a mat on the floor and a small little jewelry box full of mementos on top of his suitcase of clothes. We took a nap together. Later, we went to get ramen and he asked me to pay. I didn't mind. We went back to his place and we listened to music while we waited to go to a party. Fast forward to that night. We met up with some of his friends and they were so mean to him. They kept roasting him and picking on him and he was visibly getting upset. I stopped him for a bit so his friends could walk ahead of us. I reminded him that it was all fun and games and to ignore them. Ended up at the party and lots of people knew him. I sat out in the patio with a full few cool people that I had just met while I waited for my friend to come back from saying hello to everyone inside. He never did. I was outside in the patio with these strangers for about three hours. People kept coming up to me and asking if I was all right. I don't know if I looked sad or if I just looked like a plain loner. I went to find him and it was so packed. Didn't see him, so I walked back. I saw his roommate and asked him to please tell my friend that I was going to go get a motel. He went to tell him, came back, and said my friend was being a jerk and he would walk me back to the house instead so I didn't have to spend money on a hotel. We got to the house and I thanked him for walking me all the way back home. I really appreciated it as my friend was probs inside doing uh, substances or smashing girls. I went to bed in my friend's room and he woke me up in the middle of the night kissing me, trying to get his freak on. I simply said, no, I am not interested in having physicality. His exact words were, are you serious? What was the point of you coming here? You're such a waste of time. My feelings were really hurt. I went back to sleep, woke up, and left. Never wrote him after that. 
He had texted me a month later asking to borrow $50. I simply ignored the message and moved on. Okay, first of all, I know that area, the train going into Los Angeles. If they walked to where he lived, not that many places around there that are decent and affordable. I don't even I, I don't even want to think about where that place was and how secure it was. Not good. Story two. Met a girl online once. Can't remember where, but this was fifty to twenty years ago. We chatted for a while and seemed to hit it off. Eventually, she invited me to her house. Turns out she was having a party with about 30 people. She pretty much ignored me the whole time I was there. Hung out with some cool people and played some Mario Kart. Left when everyone else started to. Never spoke to her again. I have a lot of online communities I'm involved in between some forums I'm active in and Final Fantasy XI. I wasn't there for uh, for it, but a bunch of my Final Fantasy XI friends got together one weekend 10 to 15 years ago. One of them got drunk off his butt, trashed some stuff, and made everyone else miserable. He never got invited again. The most prominent one was where I got, I got member blocked by 9-11. I had a trip cross-country lined up for a car show and met up with a bunch of people from a forum I was on. I had been talking to a girl out there for months beforehand, and it had gotten pretty hot and heavy. So I planned to go out for the show, then hang out with her for a week or so after. I also had some work to do out there, but it was mostly to hang out with her. 9-11 happened the Tuesday before the trip. I ended up on one of the first flights out of town that Thursday. 90% of the group canceled the trips though. When I landed, she sent someone else to pick me up and she was nowhere to be found. I saw her at the show for about five minutes, but besides that, she ghosted me. I heard from her after a few days. Her ex and her got back together after 9-11 happened because life is short, let's try it again, etc. I spent most of the trip in my hotel room watching the first X-Men movie on HBO. It was a surreal experience all around. They're not all horror stories, though. Through the same group, I made friends with another girl out of state. We hung out a few times, but figured out we clicked better as friends. I met her best friend on one of my trips, and we started talking online constantly. She flew down one weekend to see how we'd get along in person. We've been married 14 years, just about. Uh, so I guess it worked out. The one on 9-11. Could you imagine how empty the planes would be right after 9-11? I flew a couple of times during COVID, and even in the cheap seats, everyone had their own row. And it was a long flight, so people, everybody stretched out in their row and took a nap. I think that's what it was like. So, story three. Back during WoW's second expansion, there was this guy in my guild I'd become friends with, mostly through other friends. We talked more and more over time and became fairly close. He had this jerkwad roommate and I could hear the guy sometimes, especially when something went wrong during a raid. He'd scream and throw fits. He was pretty awful sounding. My friend told me he wasn't just loud and obnoxious, but verbally and sometimes physically abusive too. I had my own apartment, so I said, you know what? Come stay with me. Just long enough to get you on your feet and into a place that's safe. He showed up at my place with a trash bag full of his stuff and a laptop. I set him up in the apartment and started trying to help him find a job. Well, he did not want a job. He did not get a job either. He sat in my apartment day after day, eating my food and slowly draining my savings. No matter how hard I tried to get him motivated, he would just dig in his heels and somehow become more sedentary. Eventually, I told him he had to go. I couldn't afford to keep him there. He was just couch surfing. I spoke to some people and eventually pieced together that his method of securing a new 
temporary place, was playing on the sympathies of his friends to convince them he was in a terrible living situation. It just worked really well on me because he had that loud, obnoxious roommate to play off of. He wound up calling a nearby relative to come and get him, I think his aunt. I don't know what he told her, I supposedly did, but I have never seen a more venomous look from someone in my life. As far as I know, he moved in with his sister and brother-in-law after that, but frankly, I don't care where he ended up. He also stole a bunch of my stuff. First and last time I do anything like that. I know people that have made friends and have gotten together with friends through uh, MMOs. I have a friend of mine who's very big on MMOs. Never really had a situation like that. At least nothing that bad. And of course, nobody's ever really stayed there that long. It was just a visit, a week or a weekend or something. Story four. Guy I knew in college met a girl online and spent every day talking about her. She lived about six hours away, so he planned to take a semester off and pursue this relationship. He got a job in her town and asked if I'd help him move out there since my car would hold more than he could take on a bus. I had a long weekend off and figured, why not? Road trip could be fun. I'd drive him out as a goodbye present and the way back I planned to visit Yosemite. Well, we arrive and it turns out he doesn't have an apartment lined up yet and he found a job posting in his girlfriend's town. He hadn't actually gotten the job or even applied yet. I make a bunch of phone calls and find him a room to rent that will let him move in that day with just first, last, and deposit, even without a job. I'm tired and disgusted with his lack of planning, but figure it's worth staying the night and trying to end things on good terms with my buddy. Then, he breaks down and confesses that he hasn't actually met this girl. The nights he spent video chatting with her were really just him watching her vlog and jacking it. They've never talked, never texted, never even emailed. Hell, he's never even left so much as a comment or like on one of her videos. She genuinely didn't, still doesn't know he existed. His plan was to hang out at this game shop she talks a lot about until she showed up and somehow create a relationship from that. He thought that they'd meet and she'd fall in love with him and move back to our college town to marry him, all before the next semester began. That didn't happen. Instead, I made my buddy buy a bus ticket for his ride back to school and left. He came back to school and got more cringy, not less. I lost track of him after that. Please like and subscribe if you've made it this far. I hope you'll enjoy the rest of the video and have a wonderful day. I accidentally ruined a pregnancy announcement for complete strangers, then months later was told I was responsible for the best story of their life. What are your most awkward stories that turned out to be awesome? Story 1. Second weekend at a giant college in the city as a freshman was incredibly daunting. It was really hard to find friends, and even if you did click with someone in one of the stupid orientation events, our school is so huge that unless you go all-out socially successful penguin and ask them to go to a movie or something with you 15 minutes after meeting them, you'll probably never see them again. So I'm thankfully in a class with a girl that I get along with well enough, and late in the week she asks if I want to come to a party at a bar that had rented out with that weekend. Thankful to finally have been asked to do something with the prospect of making a real friend, I'm super excited about it. Sounds so lame now, but this college is really freaking huge, and I was so overwhelmed. Fast forward to Friday. I meet her at this bar. We had a great night and made some real friends headway. Suddenly, it's 3 a.m., and we decide to go home. My dorm is across the city via a really sketchy walk, and being the terrified freshman that we were, Neither of us thought making the walk alone was a good idea. New friend offers to let me stay in her dorm. Her sweet mate is out for the weekend, so I have a bed to sleep in. We get back to her dorm, drunk and tired, and lo and behold, her crazy sweet mate has not only locked the door to her room, but zip-tied the doorknob. 
It's a college dorm, so no couch. New friend awkwardly asks if I want to sleep in her tiny old college twin bed with her. Keep in mind, we've had at most four conversations prior to this night, and I can tell she's hesitant to ask, but also doesn't want to kick me out. I'm unfamiliar with the subway and don't want to walk back alone, so I agree, and we spend the entire night spooning in a tiny twin bed. Wake up the next morning to her roommate, who had barely conversed with her at this point, giving us extremely quizzical glances. Four years later, and about to graduate, we're still living together, and she's become my best friend from college. I guess it's good, or else it would have made for a few weird exchanges in the hallway. And the roommate has also become a great friend. I, it just sounds a little bit sitcom, don't you think? Almost 70s sitcom, where, oh, there's a misunderstanding here, and you come across this situation where it looks like one thing, but it really is another, trust me. Story 2. One time, my friend's grandma passed away. So we wore all black and tried to look super fancy because we were preteens. I don't know. After the funeral, we went out to dinner at one of these chain restaurants because nothing compares with crying quite like wordplay-themed appetizers. So we're sitting there, and our server comes up, and he's bursting with flair and bouncing everywhere, and so ready to tell us about the specials that he's just going to explode with compliments. So he does. So, girls, you look super nice. Must be headed to a fun time. You're all dressed up. Got a big date? Big dance? Love it. Love dancing. You all look souped up for a big night. Where's your date? Going solo? Cute. So cute. Tell me about your big plans. He's foaming with excitement. Here are a bunch of awkwardly dressed up preteens, and he's like 20-something, and I bet he thinks we think he's so cute and charming, and my mom is probably going to give him a monster tip, but I'm 13, and I absolutely hate everybody, so of course I have to be the one that looks him straight in the eyes in my most deadpan voice I've got and say, No, we just came from a funeral. Her grandmother passed away. His face dropped so quickly that it was actually painful to watch. It was the most awkward moment I have ever created to date, and I am an awkward situation maestro. Never before had I witnessed someone actually stumble over their words out of sheer embarrassment. He was so flustered he couldn't get out more than a couple grumbles that sounded a little bit like, sorry, but more like, I have to and then he just turned around and fled. Afterwards, we giggled like the horrible little creatures that are 13-year-old girls, but it was thigh-embarrassingly awkward for that guy. Poor waiter. Also, our food was free, so that was awesome. Hell yeah, potato skins. Because nothing says grieving over a loved one's grandmother like potato skins, or better yet, free potato skins. Well, I mean, there's always, almost always a buffet at a lot of uh, funeral receptions, so I guess that is part of it. Story three. I recently finished a humanities class that is basically just community service. We have monthly meetings, and last month I was asked to be the keynote speaker at our end-of-the-year banquet. I'm not a very confident public speaker. I tend to get the shakes. But I figured I would have no problem giving a speech to 50 or so of my peers, so I accepted the honor, not quite realizing what I had gotten myself into. I wrote a short speech a few weeks in advance and showed up a half hour before the actual ceremony began during socializing hour and realized immediately that I had made an enormous mistake. The hall was packed with more than 400 students, parents, and staff. Even the college president was in attendance. To make it worse, I hadn't gotten a memo that it was a formal event. I was wearing jeans, slides, and the obnoxiously bright orange shirt that they had handed out to all the seniors in the class. I went weak-kneed as soon as I walked in the door. 
Within 15 minutes until the start of the ceremony, I took off to the local Walmart to buy a shirt and a razor. I proceeded to shave in the Walmart restroom with the limp old faucets that only dribble out a couple of teaspoons of water at a time. It took me nearly 10 minutes to eradicate my neck beard, and by the time I showed up, the ceremonies had already begun. I walked on stage with a glass of water and a razor bird face to recant my most recent dilemma as my icebreaker. The room burst into side-splitting laughter, and I was able to walk off the stage with my dignity mostly intact. Way to make the most of the situation. I mean, again, that almost sounds like something out of a movie where someone walks into a situation where they're totally out of place, but they do a few adjustments in the mirror, run some water through their hair, do something like this, and then they look perfectly presentable and just completely ace the situation. That's kind of like what this is. Have you ever had anything like that? Story 4. Midway through my first year at college, I took my recently dumped friend with me to a party. She ended up getting trashed and slobbering all over this random dude who was almost as trashed. Being the good friend that I am, I help her to the porch so she can puke her guts out. Then the random dude comes up and starts going on about how much he liked her to make sure I get her home okay, etc. I get my friend back to her place and she breaks down telling me she didn't like the guy at all. I felt bad because the guy seemed like a fairly classy dude, but what can you do? The next fall, my roommates invite a bunch of people over to chill, and one of the guys looks familiar. Before he leaves, I ask, This is a weird question, but were you at a party last winter? He replies, Yeah. At the same time, we both realized who the other person was and instantly became best friends, right through the rest of college. Too long didn't read? My drunk friend hooked up with a random dude. Six months later, I re-met the dude and we became best friends. Story 5. A woman I work with had just had a baby and asked me to be said baby's first babysitter. We're pretty tight, which I had no problem with considering I'm like the Pied Piper with kids, minus the leading into a cave, of course. So I'm babysitting an infant and an eight-year-old. No problem. Got this. Put them to bed, decide to watch Archer on their Netflix. Still good. Here's something in the background. Being a strong, black-belted, independent woman, I decided to go survey premises. So I go outside, realize it's just the apartment complex behind them. No big deal. Go back to watch Archer. Oh, hell. The door is locked. In a blind panic, I ran back and forth between the front and back doors, attempting to open clearly locked barriers, whilst vaulting their six-foot fences. Around the third lap of freakout, I discover there's a gate and decide to call the parents out for their first date since spawning. So fully out of breath, I tried one more bright idea, banging on the eight-year-old's window trying to wake her up. No avail, and the neighbor dog goes insane. End of story? Parents think it's hilarious and still bring up crying, mosquitoes sweating me on their front porch, freaking out over being a negligent baby watcher. Also, the eight-year-old may be traumatized by a night where a stranger banged on her window late at night. Who knows? What is your wrong place at the wrong time story? Story 1. I was playing baseball with a bunch of other kids in the neighborhood. I hit the ball into the woods, so I went to go get it. After carefully stepping over a metric ton of thorns, I found it. I lean over to pick it up, and as I grab it, the bush in front of me starts shaking violently. I freeze. It shakes again. Then I hear my sister behind me. I glance back and see her in the middle of all the thorns. She whispers to run on the count of three. She counts, and on three, we book it out of there. We burst out of the edge of the woods and yell for everyone to run. No one else has any idea what's going on, but they all scatter. Of course, my sister and I live farthest away. I was pretty fast, so I made it home and immediately tried telling my mom what happened. But I was out of breath and had trouble explaining. My sister finally made it in the house. She's not very fast and she has asthma. I feel like a butt for leaving her behind, but luckily whatever it was didn't follow her. 
she starts telling my mom the same thing about shaking bushes. My mom insists it was just a dog. Whatever was on the other side of that bush was huge. We knew it wasn't a dog. I'm not sure if my mom actually believed that explanation or if she was just trying to calm us down. About an hour later, we got a call from a neighbor that she saw a bear and a cub in her yard. Now that I'm older, I realize just how lucky I am because that could have gone very wrong. Oh, I agree, especially if there's a cub involved. Bears can get pretty territorial just by themselves, but nope, you don't want to upset Mama Bear. Not at all. Nope, that sister was right to say run. Story 2. A friend of mine told me this one. It's more of a just barely not in the wrong place at the wrong time story. Back in the 70s, his mom was a young woman working at a diner. There was a guy who would come in on a regular basis. Super friendly, good looking guy, always chatting with her and the other waitresses. Over time, he apparently became as much a part of the place as any of the workers. One night, my friend's mom's not feeling great. She phones up a co-worker of hers to fill in for her, and the co-worker agrees. She goes in to cover for her, and reportedly gets a ride home at the end of the night by their most charming regular. Next day, she's gone. No one hears from her, and eventually she turns up unalive. Turns out the charming guy is Ted Bundy. He'd been using the diner to pick out targets and lure the young women there away so he could... Well, do his Ted Bundy thing. Had my friend's mom gone to work that night, chances are she would have been the one getting a ride home from him, and bam. No more mom, no more friend. Good thing she got sick, I suppose. That is chilling. I mean, people disappear all the time. And it doesn't make any difference if this guy was famous or not. He was one of those narcissists, so he would have charmed anyone out of there. But yeah, that is one very close call. Story 3 I was at a party the other night, and one of the guys there told me this story. His dad decided to backpack from England to Thailand in 1979. By late December 1979, he had made it roughly halfway to his destination, which put him in Afghanistan. On the morning of December 24th, 1979, he and his friends got up and were planning to do some rock climbing. They got in the jeep of a guy that they paid to bring them out to rock climb. When they got in, he told them that they weren't going rock climbing that day, and instead, he was heading for Pakistan, and they could join him if they wanted to. Why the sudden change of plans? December 24, 1979 is the day that the Soviets invaded Afghanistan. This guy's father has pictures of him standing on a hill with a few dozen or so Soviet tanks in the field below him. Edit. I haven't gotten the pictures, as I said in the beginning of the post. This story was told to me by a guy that I randomly met at a party and will probably never see or speak to again. I don't know his last name or how to get a hold of him, so unfortunately... This story is all that we've got. Can you imagine being at the literal ground zero of a historic event like that? And do you think one of his friends complained that they weren't going rock climbing and the other one saying, shut up, we're getting out of here alive? Story four. Finally, a place to share this. When I was in kindergarten, I went to a daycare and it was brutal. Every man for himself. One day we got let out to recess, and I, still young and innocent, sat in the grass right in front of the back door we got out of the school by. The teacher sat down in front of me about 20 feet away by the mulch pin to watch the other kids, and I was relaxing in the sun when I saw some scissors fly over my shoulder and land a few feet to the side of the teacher in her chair. Now there were some kids around me and one of them threw it, but she turned around to them all playing and my dumb young self was staring at her. She assumed it was me and made me go inside and sit with the principal for the rest of our 30-minute recess. Now, I don't give a care because I was a thug anyway, 
but I did eternally resent that lady for the rest of my childhood for not completing a proper investigation. I told her that I didn't do it, and she didn't believe me. What type of a world do we live in that you can't just ever trust your kindergarten teachers? But I guess I can understand. I kind of feel bad for hating her all that time when I can understand now. Wherever you are out there, Miss Linda, curse you a little less today. Story 5 When I was somewhere around 25, a few of my friends and myself spent a week in Daytona Beach and had a great time. Driving back to New York, somewhere in northern Georgia, we decided to grab some food at a truck stop. After our greasy burgers and fries, we exited the diner and were heading across the parking lot. We came upon two men, nervously transferring stacks of cash from the trunk of one car to another. Both men had handguns holstered beneath their jackets, and as they noticed us, noticing them, one of the men made a quick movement to grab his pistol, but the other man stopped him and they just ceased what they were doing and stared quite intently at us. If there was ever a wrong place at the wrong time, this was it. All of us acted as if we were oblivious to the men's actions, but we, and when I say we, I mean everyone, the two men included, knew better. We quickly made our way to our car and left for the next four to six hours. None of us in the car said a word. My neck was sore as hell from craning it back and forth, constantly scanning for their car, which I visualized speeding up along next to us as we traveled down the highway. We never saw the men again. Story 6 Happened recently with a friend during the recent influx of refugees in Austria. He's from India, so quite often he gets confused as Middle Eastern. He was on his way back home from the supermarket when he needed to pee badly. So he walked into a nearby bar. As he was walking in, he noticed a commotion going on in there. Also, there were quite a few cops going inside as he walked in. Turns out an Afghan refugee had swiped some lady's phone and was caught in the act by an onlooker. He was refusing to give back the phone and kept insisting he didn't steal it, so the cops were called in. My friend, unfazed by the commotion, was emptying his bladder in the urinal when there was a knock on the door. Polizia! So he got out immediately, and they asked him for his identification papers. Despite doing this, he was singled out and frisked in front of everyone when one of the victim's friends said he wasn't anywhere near when the swipe happened. They let him go, but he was really disturbed by this. They eventually found the phone hidden behind that refugee's seat, and he, Afghan guy, was handcuffed and taken away. Kind of a hard one to read there, and hard lesson to learn. Racism exists no matter where you are, unfortunately. Story 7 one of my friends was finishing year 12, last year of high school in Australia, and had his muck-up day, which involves a scavenger hunt where you complete tasks for points. 50 points for stealing a local sign, etc. He came over to my house at about 2 p.m. in the afternoon to borrow a balaclava as he needed it for one of his tasks. I walked out of my house to meet him on the road wearing the balaclava as I thought it would be funny. I spoke to him for about a minute while wearing it, then handed it over. Around then, I noticed a family a few doors up from my house staring and pointing at us. I'm a fairly shy person, so I said, see you later, and walked inside. A few minutes later, my dad pulled up at home, he's a real estate agent, and told me that some people staying in units he rents out were robbed about ten minutes ago, and they saw someone in a balaclava walking around the front of our house. A few phones, a laptop, and some handbags got stolen, and I had to walk up the road and explain the situation to people. I still don't think they fully believed that I didn't do it either because they were so shocked at being robbed in broad daylight. No one will probably see this because it's an old thread and I wasted like 10 minutes. What was the creepiest thing you experienced that you thought was paranormal but was actually much scarier when you found out what really caused it? Story 1 when my friends and I initially entered college, we used to chill a lot at my friend's dad's house, who lived out in the country. Late at night, when scanning the horizon, you could see all of the stars. It wasn't like the city, but you could also see a radio tower, perhaps a few miles away. One late fall night, maybe one or two in the morning, we decided to drive out to this radio tower, just out of curiosity. It was in the middle of a large field with one entrance, which happened to be opened. We entered from there and drove about a quarter mile in towards the radio tower. 
When we got there, we noticed underneath the radio tower a rusty, beat-up car. The thing looked like it hadn't been driven in years. We pulled to the other side of the tower and just chilled for a little bit, talking about whatever and listening to music. Then one of my friends pointed towards the beat-up car. Does it look like there's a light in there? He said. We all stared at the car and, sure enough, emanating behind the dust-covered windows of the car was a dim light. We pretty quickly put our car in drive and started moving out of there. It was a field, though, so of course we moved relatively slow. The same friend who pointed out the light noticed that the car started moving along with us, following slowly. It didn't put on its headlights, but the light inside the car seemed to glow brighter. That was the moment that my friend, driving, screamed, Curse it! and hightailed it faster than I'd ever seen. We left the junk car in the dust, literally in this case, and from that day, we had always referred to this story as the ghost car story. Did we really believe in ghosts? Probably not, but paranormal is better than whatever else it could have been. Come to find out a few years later, that field was regularly being monitored by the local sheriff's office for big substance deals that apparently went down there. Had we stuck around any longer that night than we did, we could have legitimately been unalived. This was also in the era that we watched a lot of Breaking Bad, so in retrospect, it seemed to us like that could have very much been a likely outcome from that night. Luckily, we're all good, and nothing bad ever came from it for any of us. Wow. Well, I wonder if they actually ended up catching whoever was making deals down there. It doesn't seem like it. It says like that seems to be a spot where those deals happen all the time. You would think that they might spare some time to put a sheriff's car out there to kind of deter that from happening in that area, out in the country. Anyway, story two. My mom lives in Mexico, close to the Texas border in the Gulf of Mexico. She also lived close to a military base. Where she lives, there's a lot of violence, shootouts, people hanged on the bridge with no heads, etc., so I came to visit my mom for like three months, and I'd been to Mexico several times, so I got used to seeing the Mexican army and marines riding around town with big old guns and hearing crazy local stories. I also know how to get around and blend in with the locals so I won't stand out. While I was there one day, I was home alone. I went outside to feed and pet my mom's two cats, and it was already dark, and then, out of nowhere... I hear this really loud scream between a human and an animal. I got so absolutely scared because I thought some ghost or urana or someone was being tortured on some cartel type stuff. I went back inside, put my earphones on, and played music so I couldn't hear the noise. The next day, I only went outside to feed the cats. During the day, I didn't hear anything. But at night, when I fed the cats... I saw the Mexican military pass in front of my mom's house. It was a routine checkup on the neighborhood, and the sounds started again, but they weren't phased by it. At this point, I thought someone was getting tortured, and the Mexican army turned a blind eye, which is very common here. So I was even more scared. When my mom came back, I told her what happens about the really loud screaming noises. So, she starts laughing and told me that at the end of the neighborhood lived a rich narco person who owned a ranch, and he had peacocks that would make the really scary sounds at night. My family still makes fun of me to this day. Funny story, peacocks are crazy sounding. I actually live right close to someone that does have peacocks, I can confirm. If I had heard the sounds that I heard at night, I'd almost start believing in ghosts too. Story 3. I knew a kid when I was 10 who lived alone with his father up a dirt road in the middle of the woods. We were pretty good friends one summer. Everyone in our area, rural as heck, we all knew each other, thought the dad was really weird. Among the younger kids, there were rumors that the dad was a monster or a zombie or something. For one, he smelled absolutely awful and had the rankest carrion breath. Also, he would stare at the kids a lot. Creepy as hell. 
When I was 14, I found out that my friend was not the guy's son, that the creepy guy had in fact kidnapped him when he was seven or so and had kept him captive up in the woods, violating him repeatedly. My friend also turned 14 when I did, which apparently was too old to be appealing to the creepy dad, who promptly kidnapped another little boy from town about 70 miles away and brought him back to the cabin where he lived with my friend. He was even trying to pay another teenager I knew, a kind of lost boy with a juvenile record, to take my friend out into the woods and unalive him so he could be alone with his new victim, who I think was five years old. My friend realized that the same had happened to him. He'd been brainwashed for seven years, told that his parents didn't want him anymore, and had given him to the creepy guy to adopt. So he waited until the creep went to work, grabbed a little boy, and hitchhiked and walked about 40 miles to the nearest police station. Saved the kid from a terrible fate ended up going back to the family he'd been taken from seven years before. It was in the news a lot, and a TV movie was made, etc. So the creepy, smelly old weirdo really was a freaking monster. He unalived in prison, and that was a good day. Oh, man, that is just too close. I mean, what he did was just worse than being haunted by some kind of ghost who's making weird noises. That's real evil right there. Story 4. Actually, two days ago, my plant's water supply were full. One is basically a turkey baster with a large liter water bottle on the back end. You stab the squirty end into the soil and water is released as the soil dries up and evaporates. The other is a five-gallon hydroponic tank. My last distinct memory of the bottle was on Thursday night, because the water level was exactly one inch above the soil level. I avoided filling the bottle that night because if I poke it too deep and it gets near a drainage hole, the bottle drains in a matter of minutes and leaves a big puddle on the ground. When I woke up, the bottle was 100% full, and all of my other plants had been misted as the dew was still very much on the leaves still. The hydroponic tank was full as well. This would take at least 20 minutes to drain the old water, pH balance, and refill with fresh water. I live alone, and my girlfriend has a key, but doesn't really take care of plants like that and definitely wouldn't know how to fill the water bottle without flooding the floor or drain-fill hydroponic setups. I asked her, and she hasn't touched my plants in months. I don't have a history of sleepwalking, but it's the only thing I can think of at the moment. I do have a history of extreme sleep apnea, though. If you don't already have one, you might want to invest in a CO detector. One of the symptoms of CO poisoning is short-term memory loss. One guy online some time ago kept finding post-it notes around his place and thought someone was breaking in, but in reality it was him leaving the notes due to CO. Please leave your story in the comments. I would love to make a video on them in the future. Also, don't forget to like and subscribe.